Welcome. Welcome everyone. Great to see you all. My name is uh, Lars Ayer, and uh, I guess I'm now principally a novelist. I teach creative writing. I'm based here in the northeast of England, quite close to the Scottish border. So I'm in Newcastle, at the University of Newcastle here in my office. And um, my internet connection is good and strong. I don't anticipate there being any problems at all. Uh, if there are any problems, if I go offline, then wait for 20 minutes, I'll nip home, and um, I can be online again you know, pretty quickly. But as I've said, there's no, no real problems with my connection. So my name is Lars Ayer. Um, please refer to me by my first name, Lars, L-A-R-S. So please call, call me my, my, first, my first name. I've been publishing fiction for about 10 years now. And before that, I, um, I, I tried in my way to, to publish philosophy, you know, um, tried in my own way, uh, humbly, you know, with great effort to, to publish philosophy. I want to share with you now a, a quotation from uh, quotation from Samuel Beckett. Uh, let me put this up on the screen for you. Uh, let's have a look. Um, I'm going to put a quotation up on the screen here. It is from Samuel Beckett. This is just by way of intro introducing myself to you. And here is, I hope, here is the, uh, here is the image. And you'll notice here that I'm, I'm, I'm moving slowly. I'm not a aficionado of the, uh, of the internet or uh, this sort of thing, but nevertheless, we'll keep on going. Yes, now this is a quotation from Samuel Beckett, and this is an interview he gave to a French newspaper. He said these things, he said, I never read philosophy. And Beckett is asked, why not? I don't understand it. Why did you write your books? I don't know. I'm not an intellectual. I just feel things. I invented Malloy and the rest on the day I understood how stupid I'd been. I began then to write down the things I feel. And I've always loved this quotation. I, I, I don't want to compare myself to Beckett, but you know, uh, this idea of stupidity at least, I can recognize um, and I can, I can lay claim to. So I began, I, I spent many years trying to write philosophy um, in, in various media. You know, I tried to write uh, articles and books and I tried to write online on a, on a blog. And um, you know, one day I had to give up throw up my hands and say to myself, I don't understand, I don't understand what I'm doing. And I began a new kind of writing. And that kind of writing began on that day where I really embraced my stupidity, um, where I decided, look, I'm not an intellectual, I just feel things. And I began to write fiction at that moment. I didn't know I was writing fiction. I just began writing some things on the blog, which eventually led after a couple of years or three or four years, um, into writing longer pieces, in, into writing novels. And those novels came from the blog, and came out of that experience, that feeling, the overwhelming feeling of being at sea with philosophy, you know, being shipwrecked um, by philosophy. And I began to write, you know, the, the trilogy of novels, Spurious, Dogma and Exodus, the, these three novels. And then after those novels, some other novels, Wittgenstein Jr. and uh, most recently Nietzsche and the Burbs. And it was while writing my novel, Nietzsche and the Burbs, which took years and years and years, took me absolutely ages to write the thing, took, took, took forever. It was while writing that novel that the notion of fate um, became important to me. This is our, our topic today. Um, our topic today is the love of fate, creative practices, spiritual exercise. It was write, writing that novel, which, which um, drew on Nietzsche's work, you know, that novel maybe think particularly of, of fate, maybe think of um, the idea of amor fati, this idea of loving fate, uh, loving what's, what's happened, loving what's befallen us, loving everything that happened, even loving our stupidity, even, even affirming our stupidity, uh, affirming um, what we feel. It was, um, it was during writing Nietzsche and the Burbs that I thought this would be an interesting topic to, to think about um, as part of a group, you know, as part of teaching, and uh, this idea of amor fati. Uh, amor fati is a, a notion that Nietzsche himself um, uses in his work. It's, it's a, it's a, as a phrase, it's a, it's a phrase which um, he coins. 
And of course, when Nietzsche uses that expression, he's looking back to ancient philosophy. He's looking back to ancient, ancient Greece. He's looking back to the ancient Stoics, the great Stoic philosophers. So he's looking back to philosophers from that period. But it was writing Nietzsche in the verbs that I felt this was a very interesting notion to, to think about, but not to think about as a, as a philosophy lecturer, not to think about as a philosophy academic, to think in a more stupid sense than that. So what I'm doing today, the general aim, my general aim today, is to think of uh, creativity in general, to think of it as a ethical practice, to think of um, creativity, creative practitioning, practitioning is not even a word, creative practice as a practice where we're at work in a process of self-formation, it's a self-formation where we're making ourselves in some sense as creative practitioners. And I wanted to understand how creative practice and ethical practice overlap, how creative practice, ethical practice might enhance one another. This is part of my larger attempt to try and rethink pedagogy in the creative arts, to try and rethink how to teach the creative arts in general and how to bring the creative arts into some kind of dialogue, productive dialogue, I hope, with philosophy. So my main intention today is to elucidate the role of this of the spiritual exercise, this expression of spiritual exercise, as it's used in ancient Greek and modern European philosophy. I want to explore the use of this notion of a spiritual exercise for creative practitioners. And here this word spiritual shouldn't make you uh, uh, worry, it shouldn't make you balk, it's simply um, an expression for that, that which goes beyond the intellect, which goes beyond um, conscious understanding. Uh, it doesn't refer to a particular religious practice. And nor should the word exercise recall the writing prompts that you know, we use in creative writing pedagogy. I borrow the phrase spiritual exercise from philosophy. So it comes from the ancient Stoics, from the, and the Stoics thrive from the third century BC to the third century AD. It comes from the Stoics who use such exercises to help them bear the strokes of fate and sickness and poverty and exile. So the Stoics wanted to do philosophy in a particular way. They wanted to practice philosophy in such a way that they could bear what had happened to them, bear what they had undergone, bear what they saw happening around them in the world. And to progress as a Stoic, as a Stoic philosopher, to progress as a Stoic was to form oneself thereby. It's a process, the ultimate aim of which was to achieve amor fati. So the spiritual exercise is designed to try and help the Stoic person achieve amor fati, the love of fate. Now, my account of the Stoics is not original to me at all. In fact, it's framed by a very powerful, uh, controversial work published in 1987 by the French philosopher Pierre Adol. Pierre Adol, wonderful French philosopher. Uh, he lived from 1922 to 2010. And he published this book in 1987 uh, over in France, Philosophy as a Way of Life. It was translated over here, I think, in 1997. So Philosophy as a Way of Life. And this book rereads ancient Greek philosophy in a very startling and original way. What Ado does, he advances the idea of the spiritual exercise as the key for understanding ancient thought. Greek philosophy, certainly. But Ado also gestures towards philosophy in India, in China. Um, he, he thinks about philosophy in a more general sense. He doesn't develop these readings in any particular depth, but he gestures towards a rethinking of ancient philosophy as such. Not just a rethinking, I suppose a reframing, a complete shift in how we understand what philosophy is about. And he has in particular a special regard for Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic philosopher who lived from 121 to 180 AD, um, who wrote a work of what we might call auto-philosophy, which is the book called The Meditations. Here it is in my office. But, oh, you can't see it. You've seen my quotation. Let me take my quotation down. Um, this is the work called The Meditations. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. 
There we are. Here is the meditations by, um, by Marcus Aurelius. And I'm using this phrase auto philosophy, which is an expression I only learned yesterday. Um, I, I had a correspondent wrote to me and told me he was working on this very topic, auto philosophy. That correspondent, and this is a bit of a digression, that correspondent is none other than David Kishik. David Kishik, who is himself um, a writer of auto philosophy. Um, his first book, Wittgenstein's Form of Life. His second book, and Gambon and the Coming Politics. If you've read these, these are books like no other. These are not standard academic books. Interesting things are happening in these books. Another book he wrote, the work on Benjamin, the Manhattan Project. It's a kind of work, of work of fiction. And most excitingly, I have on my desk right here in a, a manuscript of a new David Kishik book right here called Self Study. Self-study, wonderful, very exciting book. I hope it'll be out soon. And I borrowed from this book, Self-study, this idea of auto-philosophy. So I borrowed auto-philosophy from David Kishik uh, from his new book, which is called Self-study, which is a kind of autobiogra autobiography of sorts. And he links to his earlier books. He's written now five books. I think there are five books, a couple more, which I, I don't have here today in the office. These books hang together as a, um, a contemporary version, I would say, of, of, of a spiritual exercise in some way. So that's my hot tip. I, I, I'll, um, I, I'll stop thinking about um, Kishik now. I'll stop talking about Kishik now. Maybe I should put one quote. Or maybe I'll, I'll share you a quotation from Kishik's book. It's, uh, this is a new one. It's still not in print. I'm going to share you a quotation from this, this hot off the press book. And let me try and share this on my screen. This time I'll be much faster, I promise. Uh, let's have a look. Here we are. And this is um, a quotation from David Kishik's book. If I start, if I use this, uh, here we go. Yes, this is better, I think. Philosophy began with a basic yet, yet, yet elusive plea, know thyself. The idea was that humans cannot be moral without being selfish not in the negative sense of lacking consideration for others, but in the positive sense of concerning oneself with oneself. In other words, life is not worth living unless you examine it. As Foucault demonstrates, the most elementary civic duty in an ancient democracy was the care of the self. But the Greek answer to the question, what is philosophy, was already auto-philosophy. It was always a practice or an activity never a doctrine or a law. Auto-philosophy was not a preparation for life, but a form of life in and of itself, occupying the center of the classical cultural experience. And that's David Kishik from his book, Self-Study, not yet uh, in print, a uh, wonderful, very interesting book. I read it last night, uh, all in one go, I couldn't resist, fantastic work. And what Kishik says here is that philosophy it's about knowing oneself. There's, there's philosophy begins in, in, in the West with this idea of knowing thyself. And that having a concern for oneself, in this sense, knowing oneself is not sheer selfishness. There's a positive sense of this concern, of this self-concern. And the idea here is, you know, this is familiar from Plato's work from Socrates, life is not worth living and, uh, unless you examine it. And this is, a, this is what Foucault argues in his book, The Care of the Self. You know, an elementary duty in ancient Greece, in the ancient democracies of Athens, was, was care of the self in some sense. Thinking about oneself, knowing oneself. And as part of this knowing oneself, it's a practice of auto-philosophy, of doing philosophy as a practice, as an activity, never as a doctrine, never as a law, practicing philosophy, Practicing philosophy not as a preparation for something, but as an activity, as a form of life in and of itself. So practicing philosophy as a form of life, as a way of living, not for something, but as the thing itself. And as Kishik says here, and this is a thought very reminiscent of, of um, Foucault, of course, but also of Pierre Addo, who influenced Foucault, of Pierre Addo. The idea that this occupies the center of um, political life you know, back in Athens, the idea of working on oneself, philosophy as a practice, these are very um, 
very Pierre Adoian thoughts. Okay, so I'm still introducing what I'm doing today in a roundabout way. Um, I'm not going to stay solely with ancient philosophy. And the reasons for that will become clear. We live in a very different time to Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics. For Pierre Addo, the thoughts of the Stoics echo down the ages. For me, I feel a bit more conflicted about this. Um, I don't feel like, uh, I'm using the word feel rather than think here. You know, I'm quite deliberately, I feel a sense of distance with respect to the Stoics. And, and in short, that the Stoics lived in a, in a cosmos. They lived under a cosmos, in a cosmos. The ancient Greek word implies order. Celestial order it implies order in the universe. The Greeks, the Stoics, lived in a cosmos, an orderable world, and a world that was ordered. Christians came to live in a cosmos too. And I wonder whether we live in a cosmos in the same sense. There's that wonderful, uh, wonderful book by Blanchot, Maurice Blanchot, the uh, literary writer who lived from 1907 to 2003. Maurice Blanchot, and this book is called The Writing of the Disaster. You could translate it the, the disaster right. And the idea is etymologically, the word disaster refers to an absence of stars. There are no more stars. An absence of order. The universe is not what it was. It's not ordered in the same way. It's not fixed in the same way. So we live in a different time to that of Marcus Aurelius, to that of the, of the Stoics, to that time that Pierre Addo celebrates. And the question then is, well, okay, what do spiritual exercises mean in our time? What can we do with a spiritual exercise now? Well, in order to try and address this question, I thought I'd, 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 I'd work um, with you uh, looking at the ideas of Nietzsche, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, who's a very famous philosopher, I'm told the most read philosopher in the world. Nietzsche was born in 1844, died in 1900. So I'm gonna work with the, the ideas of, of Friedrich Nietzsche, not as a, as a scholar, Primarily, I'm not, not, not here as a, as a scholar, as an academic in philosophy, any, any sort of things at all. We're working with feelings here, we're working with stupidity. So I, I want to approach Nietzsche really stupidly, um, taking all kinds of shortcuts, doing, committing all kinds of scholarly um, and errors. But you know, what I want to say is, what I want to argue is that Nietzsche's thought can be understood as offering us a spiritual exercise, especially in the idea of eternal return or eternal recurrence. I want to interpret this, you know, this is a violent hermeneutic move, but you know, why not? Um, I want to interpret this as a spiritual exercise. I want to assess how useful that exercise might be for us today. Um, I'm, I'm addressing an audience here, you know, of creative practitioners and others as well. So I want to think this creatively. Of what use does the idea of eternal return of eternal recurrence, what idea does it have for us creatively? Now, my own answer to this question is the novel Nietzsche and the Birds. So that, that's my own response. It, it, it's a fictional, uh, it's a, the work of fiction. That's my own response, trying to think, try and think through uh, what Nietzsche poses to us as a spiritual exercise. So in that novel, I try to work through what it might mean to, to understand Nietzsche's thought in that way. And um, the book itself is an attempt at a, at a spiritual exercise. But I also want to respond to Nietzsche's work in, in this forum here as well, um, as, as something that, you know, that, that we can use to think about our creativity. The method I'm following here will be readings via quotations and commentaries on quotations. So I'll be using PowerPoint. You know, PowerPoint isn't always the, the most wonderful tool to use, but I want the quotations up before you. I know how hard it is it can be to, it can be to take in quotations. So I'll be um, giving short readings, quotations, commentaries and quotations that will lead every now and again into, into exercises. So the exercises that we have normally in, in creative writing workshops. So um, this will be you know, a, a workshop. Um, this, this is how I'm thinking of the event here today uh, as primarily um, a creative practice workshop. So there will be exercises along the way. And I hope that from these exercises, you can take some opportunities for things you want to want to develop further. Uh, that's the idea. So I hope you'll leave the session today with some ideas you can develop. And we have two halves to our session today. The first two hours, you know, the way I thought about it was to work on ancient philosophy in the, in the first two hours and modern philosophy in the second two hours. 
we'll see how it goes. Let's be flexible with the structure. Uh, typically, you know, I, I will use most of the two hours each time. There will be, you know, minutes of, of, of for you to write, you know, to, to, to write things. We'll see how it goes. But I, I tend to use, you know, most of those two hours both times. Okay, so that's a general introduction. You can see roughly how it falls together. I want them to, to, to make a beginning. Um, and it's to, to the ado, Pierre Ado that I start. I want to talk in a little more detail about the, the ideas I've begun to think about with you. Let's have a look. Um, I'll begin with uh, sharing some of Pierre Ado's reflections on the notion of conversion, of being converted. Right, so. So, oops, this is not the right one. Sorry, let me uh, get out of this. Conversion slide. Share my screen and apologies for being so clumsy with this, it's terrible. But here we are. Yes, that's better. Slideshow from current slide. Oops. There. Right. Okay. So I want to contextualize what I have here on the screen for you. I want to talk in more general terms, first of all. In ancient philosophy, in ancient philosophy in general, What's crucial is philosophy as a practice, as something you do. In the ancient schools of philosophy back in Greece did not think of philosophy at all as something intellectual or formal or theoretical, not primarily. Philosophy was about a choice, a conversion, which committed an entire life, making it soul to philosophy and you know the exercise of philosophy then is not intellectual solely but also spiritual spiritual here understood in a general sense it's not solely about intellect it's about developing oneself and one's relationship to the world around one the philosopher did not you know philosophy was concerned with how knowing how to live in a very broad sense. It's, it's about an art of living, about a way of life. There were different schools of philosophy in those times. Plato and Aristotle both had different schools of philosophy. And each time these schools were an invitation to cultivate an art of living, a way of life. You became disciples of a school. It could be the Stoics, it could be the Epicureans. You became a, 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 a pupil of that school in order to um, practice a way of life, a form of life. Now, to evoke this term that Pierre Adot places such, such an a importance um, to is to evoke this term spiritual exercise. It was spiritual exercise that you were engaged with when you joined these schools of philosophy. And these exercises involved not just our intellect, not just reason, but all of our faculties, including emotion, including imagination. So all our faculties are involved. And the idea of, the, of these spiritual exercises is to simply reduce suffering, to increase happiness. That's the aim here, to reduce suffering, to increase happiness, to make us better able to live in the world. And you know, the goal of spiritual exercise is, is not simply an accommodation to the world as it is. It's also to transform ourselves, transform our vision of the world, transform our experience. You know, it's to metamorphose ourselves, not simply morally, becoming simply a better person. If I can put it this way, existentially, in terms of what we are. Now, the idea then for the ancient philosophers is that philosophy is something that you practice, that you do. And you know, anyone can, can be called a philosopher, whether or not they've written books, 
whether, whether or not they lecture to other people in philosophy. Being a philosopher means living in accordance with various precepts. It means undergoing a, a, a transformation. That's what it meant for the ancient Greeks. And in fact, that's, that's the meaning of philosophy according to Pierre Ardot for, for centuries and centuries, even through up to the Christian era. To be a philosopher is someone who's just trying to live, trying to live in some way, trying to deliberately to form themselves, not to live passively, but to do something, to be something. Pierre Ardot, in, in a wonderful little essay called Conversion, writes about this idea of, of conversion. The Latin word, he says, and this is right up here on the screen before us, corresponds to two different Greek words meaning different things. On the one hand, there is epistrophe, which means a change in orientation, and implies the idea of a return, a return to an origin or a return to oneself. On the other hand, there is the word metanoia, which means a change in thought or repentance, implying the idea of mutation and rebirth. Therefore, in the idea of a conversion, there is an internal opposition between the idea of a return to an origin and the idea of a rebirth. Now, I love the way Pierre Ardot writes. He writes in a very simple style, he's very readable. His work has been read by people all over the world. He received letters from all over the world, from all kinds of places, uh, people from all walks of life enjoying his work. Philosophy as a way of life is the key text by him. Uh, but he, he wrote uh, there's other books coming out in English, you know, translated uh, more recently. So the word conversion contains a sense of a change in orientation. You're changing what it is you're looking at, what it is you're doing, what it is you're thinking about. You know, it involves a return to an origin, a return to oneself. Uh, you know, you're trying to recover something that that isn't there anymore. You're trying to find something that's concealed. You're trying to find a way back in some way. But there's also a sense in which you're changed in thought. Maybe you, you repent in some way. You want to be forgiven in some sense. A mutation, a rebirth. It's a very rich idea, this idea of conversion. A return to an origin, a rebirth. I love both of these ideas, you know, just they remind me of this, of this great sense, of this great word um, which um, the philosopher Søren Kierkegaard uses. Kierkegaard, the great 19th century Danish philosopher. He has this idea of repetition. The repetition for Kierkegaard is literally, you know, the expression he uses, um, if you think of it etymologically, means a retaking, you know, retaking, um, living something over again, doing something over again, a rebirth. And that's what we find here, this idea of conversion, a rebirth. And as, as Pierre Ardot continues, continues here in this essay, you know, philosophy was essentially a form of conversion in antiquity, it's an act of return to the self by means of a violent extraction from alienation and unconsciousness. Western philosophy stems from this fundamental fact. What a, what a, what a strong claim this is, and you can imagine and particularly recent philosophy, recent philosophy is dominated, you know, in, in, in the Anglophone world by the model of the natural sciences. So recent philosophy in the Anglophone world is all about the natural sciences. It's all about, um, about having a careful methodology, rigorous logic, empirical observation, testing. There's always a search for austerity, precision of language a filtering out of the personal and emotional dimensions of experience. So I'm here, I'm characterizing recent philosophy in the, in the Anglophone world, in, in Britain and America, and elsewhere too, you know, in Germany now, in Scandinavia, um, that philosophy is often modeled on the sciences, logic, empirical observation, testing. These things are very important in science. The search for austerity and precision of language, nothing literary. The filtering out of the personal and the emotional, the filtering out of what I've called stupidity and feeling, the filtering out of um, what David Kishik calls auto philosophy. So, auto philosophy, you know, it's not particularly important in, the, in this tradition influenced by the natural sciences. Pierre Ardo is doing something very different. For him, imagination and sensibility in general played a very important role in spiritual exercises. 
So when Pierre Ardo publishes the book, Philosophy as a Way of Life, he's really striking against Anglophone philosophy in general. And as you can imagine, the response from Anglophone philosophy to Pierre Ardo is often extremely negative. For them, Pierre Ardo is doing something very different to philosophy. But, you know, if you read Anglo-American philosophy, there are moments in Anglo-American philosophy where you do find echoes of Pierre Addo's work, in particular in the work of Wittgenstein. Ludwig Wittgenstein, the great philosopher of the 20th century, says that to, to, to work on philosophy is to work on yourself. To work on philosophy is to work on yourself. And Wittgenstein throughout his life attempted to change himself spiritually. Um, to alter the person he was. He wrote notes to himself in the manner of a Stoic philosopher. He wrote notes to himself. These have been published as Culture and Value, which I, which I really recommend um, to anyone. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. These are notes he wrote to himself, reflections on various topics. Culture and Value, most wonderful little book. Um, very much in the tradition of Pierre Hadeau. So, okay, this idea of conversion is particularly important. Particularly significant to Pierre Ardo. Let me look at you all, look at you all again without a quotation between us. The philosopher that I want to think about with Ardo, Pierre Ardo, is Marcus Aurelius. The philosopher Marcus Aurelius, who, strangely enough, was played by Richard Harris in the film Gladiator, Ridley Scott's film Gladiator. There's an old king, you know, an old, sorry, an old emperor, you know, and Richard Harris. He's actually Marcus Aurelius, very wise. You know, he gives, he gives advice in a wise way. So Marcus Aurelius, um, he pops up in, in the film Gladiator. He's a, a thinker who has informed a lot of contemporary culture. The Stoics are enjoying a real revival. Um, and Marcus is best known for his book, The Meditations. And in this book, you know, Marcus Aurelius and reflects in the thick of his life while living his life, he reflects on how he might improve himself. And what's amazing about Marcus Aurelius, he, he does so, he writes this book as the emperor of, of, you know, of Rome. He, he, he's the Roman emperor. His philosophical idol was a freed slave called Epictetus, a freed slave. And now an emperor, the emperor of Rome, meditating on ideas that were passed down to him by, um, by uh, Epictetus. And he's writing this book, which we know as the meditation. This book wasn't published um, originally. Uh, it, was, it was a collection of private notes. That's all it was. You know, it's it just about, um, about exercises that Pierre Addo set for himself. Well, let me contextualize these remarks about, um, about Marcus Aurelius. We're looking again at a, um, at a slide uh, which captures, I think, what, what the Stoics mean by spiritual exercise. Let me just share this with you. So, um, yes, here we are. In general, spiritual exercises involve conversion, as we've seen, liberation from the state of alienation into which the self has been plunged. We're trying to recover an origin of sorts. We're trying to turn away from alienation. The of alienation simply means, you know, you're not yourself. You're not who it is you are. You've lost yourself. You're trying to find yourself. You're wandering in the world. Think of that film. If you've seen that film by Terence Malick, the name of that film has just fallen out of my head as these things do. Now it's returned. The name of that film is The Knight of Cups. The Knight of Cups. There's a character who's lost. He's wandering the world. His name is Rick. He's not sure what his place is in the world. He knows there's something he's trying to find something he was entrusted with when he was very young, something his father gave him. The idea is that for Rick, the Stoics, 
is we have to pass through spiritual exercises of various kinds in order to return to the self we were, that we once were. And why do we fall into the state of alienation? Because of worries, passions, and desires. These worries, passions, and desires have distracted us from the people we are. We're looking for a liberation of our moral person. What about egotistic, egoistic, sorry, passionate individuality, open to uh, individuality, open to universality? So we want to move from, uh, to, from the particular to the universal. Well, how do we do this? Well, one of the first things we can do is to strive for objectivity. That's what the Stoics argue. It's not so much things in the world that cause suffering, but our beliefs about those things. We should try to perceive the world as it is in itself, without subjective colouring. This is um, what we find in the Stoics, the ancient Stoics. This is what the, the uh, spiritual exercise is supposed to accomplish. And here we see, we hear echoes of what you might find in contemporary discourse. We find echoes of this contemporary idea of resilience. I don't know about you, but I hear this word all around me. The idea of resilience is trying to help people cope with what happens to them, cope with what befalls them. We hear echoes of this in, if you search online for, you know, if you search for stoic based therapy, we hear echoes of this in, in, in calls for therapists, for therapists to own your life, to lay claim to your life and the things that happen to you, to accept the things that you can change, sorry, to make changes that you can change and to accept the things that you can't. We hear it in the serenity, serenity prayer of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. That's the first thing spiritual exercise directs us towards. The second thing is to direct our actions to the interests of the human community at large, to the whole of humankind, and indeed, perhaps to the cosmos in general, rather than to our own advantage. And that's what we see often in the meditations, Marcus Aurelius, he's the emperor. He's trying to think of human, the human community as a whole. He actually goes out as a, as a young man to um, help gather in the harvest. You know, he's part of the whole. He's always trying to um, avoid the problems that follow from pride, he wanted to remain humble. Like all the ancient Stoics, he kept his hair short. He wore a short tunic, a uh, rough material. He slept in a, a very rough bed. The third thing is what interests me most. And that is the idea of the Stoics attuning their ideas to the way the universe works. Not merely accepting that things happen as they do, but actively willing for things to happen in the way they happen. So let me just go through that again. It's the idea that you don't just accept that things happen um, as they do. You actually want to have those things to happen in that way. It's quite a notion, this notion. When you think about this notion is to be um, confounded. But more than that, it's to be I, I find it a very disturbing idea to actively will the things to happen in the way that they happen. The love of fate. We're going to be circling around this idea again and again today. You don't just accept the world passively. You actually want things to happen in the way they happen. So let me restate what we have here on the screen before us. You can use this is summary of, of how Stoic spiritual exercises work. The idea is to strive to see the world as it is, without subjective colouring, without regard to what we want or desire, without regard to our hunger, our passions. The idea is to try and to put our passions to one side, to see things as they are. And the idea is not simply to want the, the world, so not, the idea is not simply to see the world as it is in itself, but to actually want the world to be as it is, to want the world to be as it is and no other. This is the love of fate and what a confounding, difficult notion it is. It's like the Sermon on the Mount or something, you know, you, Often these, these teachings are so hard to, to think about. You can think about them for the rest of your life. And this is one which has really stayed with me in my novel, Nietzsche from the Burbs, is all about the attempt to love fate, and to love fate in the contemporary world, in the contemporary situation. To love fate, this idea of loving fate is a perplexing and difficult one. Okay, so that's how spiritual exercises work. 
And let me just restate this. The expression amor fati, coined by Nietzsche, is coined by Nietzsche, but it's meant to characterize Stoic philosophy. And put very simply, we don't control most of what happens to us in life. This means we're very vulnerable to all kinds of things. We're powerless with respect to them. But what we do control is, our, is the nature of our reaction to those events. We're not powerless in this respect. We can despise what happens. We can jeer at it. We can weep to ourselves, all this stuff. We can lament our powerlessness. We can also love, embrace, and make the most of what happens. The danger of writing things in this way, it can sound inane. It can sound um, silly. The Stoics meant this, and what they're asking us to do is, is not simply um, dance about and sing and say, isn't life wonderful? Is to confront darkness, suffering, not just our own suffering, but the suffering of others. Is to confront all the difficulties of living in the world, to confront all of that, and to embrace it, to love it, even to affirm it, to affirm what it is that's happened to us. And this idea of conversion, we return to the origin, this idea of Kierkegaard, this idea of repetition. We're going to repeat our lives, we repeat everything in some sense. Now, this is why I think this is important to creative practitioners. When we think of what we do as creative practitioners, and we think of the kind of work we make or want to make, and we think of that wake, if we, we think of what we make, we, we, we're converting in some way, we're turning back, we're laying claim to the past, and we're doing so with the aim of transforming ourselves as creators, but perhaps also as human beings as well. We are reaching back into an origin, an origin that can't be exhausted, an origin that gives and gives and gives, a wellspring. So we're reaching back into this wellspring, something that gives itself to us anew each time we, we try to seize it. So it's a conversion that is an opening, an opening to ourselves, to our lives, to our existence. And you know, more than that, it's in some sense an attempt to affirm what's befallen us, what's happened to us, to affirm it in our creative work. And you know, I don't I don't want to put aside the difficulties of this. So I want to I want us to, I want to face this the difficulty, the, the hardness of this. Um, so this is, this is the idea, to love and embrace and affirm what has happened. I'll give you some samples of some of the Stoic, what Stoics wrote or, or said. The Stoics um, didn't always write for publication. Epictetus dictated some of his thoughts. Well, I suppose he was teaching and, and some of the people in, um, with him wrote down what he said. Let death be before your eyes every day. You will never have any abject thought nor excessive desire. This is a stoic spiritual exercise. Epictetus says, think of death. Keep death before your eyes. Keep the fact that you're going to die before your eyes. Keep the fact that you're mortal before your eyes. And according to Epictetus, if you do this in the right way, you will never have an abject thought. Nothing need disgust you. Nor will you have an excessive desire a passion that, that overruns. Epictetus was a man who lived in great poverty. He'd been raised a slave. He was freed as a young man. He lived in a, he was so poor, he lived in this room. He kept the door unlocked. He said, anyone can break in, there's nothing to steal. There's nothing in here. Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, some, says something similar here. Let your every deed and word and thought be those of one who might depart from this life this very moment. Similar idea, death is important. For Aurelius, live as though you're about to die. That the things you're doing now will be your, will be your testimony. The deeds you're performing right now, the, 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 the things you're saying, even the things you're thinking. These might be the last things you're, you're doing, you're, you're, you're saying or you're thinking. Something from Seneca. Place before your mind's eye the vast spread of time's abyss, 
and embrace the universe, and then compare what we call human life with infinity. Just think about the vastness of the cosmos. Think about the billions of years before human life existed, the billions of years that will um, happen after we disappear. Think of our own time, the span of our lives um, in, in, in the whole, in the cosmos. So, so short, so fleeting, a better time in general. You notice each time these thinkers are exhorting us to do something, we are to be engaged in an exercise, but to try to do something, try to think something, hold this thought in our heads, keep it there and see what we feel, see what we think. Our response is not just intellectual, our response is also a feeling response, an imaginative response. So that's what Stoic spiritual exercises look like. Uh, Marcus's book, Marcus Ruiz's book, The Meditations, is a collection of just short paragraphs like this. And Marcus Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius wrote them for himself. Oh, here's a picture of Richard Harris from Gladiator on the right. <laughs> there he is with his armor. Um, and there is Epictetus, a picture of him on the left. Now, I want to come to the meditations. Written by someone, as I've said, who's, who's in the thick of life, consumed by duties and beset by temptations. You know, part of the meditations were written when Marcus was on military campaign against German tribes um, by the Danube. And every night he'd go back to his tent and he'd write something. And what he wrote was intended not for publication, but for private contemplation and use. It's for him to use, then notes to himself. He seeks to train himself to be a human being in accordance with the precepts of Stoicism. So he's thinking about Epictetus and what Epictetus taught. It's crucial here that what he, what he writes is very carefully written in a very refined literary form. His language shapes his thought very carefully. And it's something that is very important to him. The idea that you write very carefully, you put together your thoughts with great care in, a, in an appropriate way. So and here's a theme we will come back to. The spiritual exercises can involve developing a literary style, a particular style for self-examination, for the work of memory. So written texts, the Stoics were very well wrought. That you know, Marx's um, book has very engaged literary qualities. And we can see how he went to them and consulted them and um, cherished them and acted according to them. Um, Self-examining thoughts. Uh, Wittgenstein, that book I mentioned already, Culture and Value. He's also written in this very attractive literary way. The style is part of what makes those thoughts usable, contemplatable. Um, there's a beauty to them, an austere beauty to culture and value. And also to David Kishik's work. I've mentioned David Kishik already, reading this latest book in manuscript of his. Um, style is of extreme importance. There's a wonderful sobriety of time. So the idea is, is writing carefully is to translate vague feelings into something more precise, discriminate the literary expression. Um, this, this is supposed to help you guide your mind to new insights. So language here is not simply a mirror to your thought, it shapes your thought. And perhaps the idea is in writing, when you're writing as a spiritual exercise, is to forge a new language, a new way of writing, to, to find a new way of expressing oneself so that things can be expressed in a new way, uh, to, to, to make possible a greater range of emotion, um, perception. That's the idea. So, okay, this is how Marcus is writing his work. And his meditations show us how an apparently abstract and forbidding concern with philosophical ideas can be made concrete in a principled way of life. So his concern with logic leads Marcus to struggle against false impressions and flattery. His concern with physics 
makes him see himself as part of a cosmic totality. His concern with the grounds of right action causes him to attempt to improve his own relationship with others. Some trained in philosophy, um, this, this little paragraph which makes me really excited because the different branches of intellectual inquiry are all here in Marcus's thoughts, are all here devoted to what Foucault calls self-care. Um, Marcus called it, you know, spirit, a spiritual exercise. Everything is devoted to concrete existence, to life here and now. And, you know, running ahead of myself, you can see then why creative activity would, would be something similar for me. That the creative life that we seek as, as practitioners is not only about the things we make, it's about remaking ourselves in some way. I think, anyway. I wonder if this, if this, if this is a feeling you all share. We can come to that in a moment. But my attempt here is to think ethically, not about the rights and wrongs of particular action, but ethically in the sense of our own self formation, what makes us who we are, what makes us able to change who we are, what makes us able to convert, to repeat our origin, to repeat our primal scene that lies at the heart of our lives, um, to reach back those formative moments where things were revealed to us. And that's why I find Marx's meditation so wonderful, such a tonic. And I'll give you a quotation from Marcus. I don't, I don't want to bury you in Marx's um, thoughts, but I thought I'd give you this, this paragraph. Think often of the speed with which all that is and comes to be passes away and vanishes. The being is like a river in perpetual flux. Its activities are in constant transformation. And its causes in myriad varieties. Scarcely anything is stable, even that which is close at hand. Dwell, too, on the infinite gulf of the past and the future, in which all things vanish away. A typical sentence from Marcus. I suppose, think about a larger context, a larger whole. Here, what he's asking us to do is to think about existence, about being as a river in perpetual flux. Things are always changing. Of course, we think here of Heraclitus. You can't step into the same river once. You might also think, sorry, you can't step into the same river twice. You think of, uh, of, um, of Cratylus. You can't step into the same river once. You can't step into the same river once because everything is in flux. In the very act of stepping, you are changed by that which you're stepping into, and you are changed as the person who steps. Activities are in constant transformation. Things are changing. Nothing is stable. Even that which is close at hand. This is what Marcus is writing to himself. He's writing these things to himself in his tent on campaign by the Danube. He's trying to recall himself these stoic precepts of the sage he took as a master. Now, I've been talking for a long time. My apologies for talking for a long time. I want to, for you to um, give you a challenge an exercise. Marcus sought to transform the way he experienced the world, his way of being. Meditation was written to be preserved and consulted. I want you now to imagine writing your own meditations, reflecting what you've learned as a creative practitioner, which you might want to preserve and consult in the future. And before I ask you to begin, it occurs to me, just from thinking about Marcus as I've, as I've been talking, one of the things that Marcus does is he preserves the thoughts of others. He semi-quotes other people. He tells stories that other people have told. I've asked you here to write five key spiritual exhortations to yourself, but please feel free in writing them to borrow from others, from other authors that you found interesting, from the lives of other people. Please feel free to quote people you know. Don't feel you have to come up with this all by yourself. What I'd like you to do until, well, let's have a look now. It's, I make it five to, well, five to three my time, but five to the hour, um, GM, yeah. Um, please spend 25 minutes crafting 
some spiritual exhortations in the manner of the Stoics, in the manner of what we've been talking about. Following the 25 minutes, we will share and discuss some of these exhortations. Hello everyone, welcome back. I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing your thoughts. <clears throat> Anyone care to volunteer to be, to be the first person? Thank you, Clara, for sense sharing your work, by the way. Anyone care to read their work out loud? <clears throat> so a warm welcome back. I hope you're all refreshed and ready for um, some modern auto philosophy. So we're moving now from the ancient world to the modern world. We're moving from Marcus Aurelius and Pierre Adol to um, Friedrich Nietzsche. So we're moving to Nietzsche's work, we're moving to the modern world. And uh, I want to share with you um, some elements of Nietzsche's thought, which again, like the first session, I very much hope will help you with your creative work. Uh, that's very much the idea for me. So let me now um, share with you my PowerPoint. Uh -huh. Here we are, so modern auto philosophy. Just to recall what we're looking at here is this movement to write philosophical autobiography. Autobiography, which, is, which takes all of, all of the different branches of philosophy, logic and metaphysics, ethics and aesthetics, takes them all and uses them to try to create a self, to make a self, to transform a self, to convert a self. And our guide in this next, um, over the next two hours is Nietzsche, 1844 to 1900. And let me just give you a, a quotation there straight away. My formula for greatness in a human being is amor fati, that one wants nothing to be different, not forward, not backward, not in all eternity, not merely bear what is necessary, still less conceal it, but love it. This quotation will, will resonate, hopefully, with the, um, with the work of, of Marcus Aurelius and the other Stoics that we looked at in the first half of um, today's session. This is the idea of the greatness, the greatness in the human being is amor fati. And there we see a, a painting of, of Nietzsche by Edvard Munch. Let me just read you a bit of Nietzsche, just to get us all into the Nietzsche mood. I'm going to close my window here, so I don't hear the helicopter landing outside. Uh, we'll read a bit of Nietzsche, just to get into that, that Nietzsche mood. This is, this is some early Nietzsche from Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense. From Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense, a short essay unpublished in his lifetime. Once upon a time, in some out-of-the-way corner of, of that universe, it is dispersed into numberless twinkling solar systems. There was a star upon which clever beasts invented knowing. That was the most arrogant and mendacious minute of world history, but nevertheless, it was only a minute. After nature, after nature had drawn a few breaths, the star cooled and congealed, and the clever beasts had to die. One might invent such a fable. And yet he still would not have had and had adequately illustrated how miserable, how shadowy and transient, how aimless and arbitrary the human intellect looks within nature. There were eternities during which it did not exist. And when it is all over with the human intellect, nothing will have happened. This intellect has no additional mission which would lead it beyond human life. A wonderfully evocative quotation, irresistible. I love this. What is it about? Well, it's about the human being, human beings in general, being pretty insignificant in the larger scheme of things. It's about human beings being marginal, irrelevant. It's about human beings being a tiny part of an enormous cosmos, and only a tiny part. And Marcus Aurelius, there's a sense in which the human being is a real part of the universe and that the universe and its order is reflected or can be reflected 
in the order of each human being. But here with Nietzsche, we find something very different. What are human beings? Clever beasts who invented knowing. World history is of no great significance. After nature had drawn a few breaths, the star cooled and congealed, and the clever beast had to die. It amounts to nothing. It leads nowhere. Miserable, shadowy, transient, aimless, arbitrary. That's the human intellect within nature. That's human reason. So here we see something profoundly different when we compare it to Marcus Aurelius. Here we have a, the abandonment of this conception of the human being at the center of things or even part of things. You know what? Let's read some more Nietzsche because it's just so rich. The world, a monster of force, without beginning, without end, a fixed iron quantity of force, which grows neither larger nor smaller, which doesn't exhaust but only transforms itself as a whole unchanging in size, an economy without expenditure and losses, but equally without increase, without income, an ocean of forces storming and flooding within themselves, eternally changing, eternally rushing back. This world is the will to power and nothing besides. Here we have a new conception of what the universe is, a new idea of the cosmos. No longer is the cosmos ordered. No longer is it stable. The stars are not in place. What we find instead is force. Force that is beginningless and endless. Force that just storms and floods, that changes, that rushes back and rushes forward. All we have is a struggle between forces. And the human being is part of this. So no longer is there a cosmos. There is only an anti-cosmos. Disorder. Chaos. And one more treat here. One more bit of Nietzsche. A very famous passage. But let's read it anyway. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God, as many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost? asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, emigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried. I will tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually? Backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as though through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the gravediggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of a divine decomposition? Gods too decompose. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. Magnificent prose. Extraordinary prose. Very carefully written prose. Very musical prose. This is a musical prose. And this theme of music is one I want to come back to. So we'll return to this theme of music. What I want to do is now to set a framework for our reading of Nietzsche is to lay out some of the basics of Nietzsche's thoughts so we can then approach him as someone from whom we can learn creative things from, someone from whom we can learn about music. So let me now proceed to give you a basic account 
of what Nietzsche's thought is all about. Okay, now, for Nietzsche, we are primarily affective rather than thinking beings. And this is the contrast with Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics. For the Stoics, we are certainly affective beings, but we are first and foremost thinking beings. What is crucial for us is that we use reason. Another interesting thing here, Nietzsche argues that our passions are barely open to self-examination at all. We don't understand ourselves. We don't know ourselves. We're mysterious to ourselves. As Nietzsche says, we are unknown to ourselves, we know us. So our passions, and our passions make up our, our affective life, our passions are barely open to self-examination. We are unable to recognize or understand the way we are shaped by drives and forces, let alone all of these passions rationally. So we are shaped by passions, by drives, by forces. We don't understand how. We have no chance of ordering these passions rationally. And here, Marcus Aurelius's attempt to understand what we are and how we can transform ourselves, well, for Nietzsche, it's totally wrong-headed. Aurelius doesn't understand, Marcus Aurelius doesn't understand what we are as human beings. We don't even know how to order our passions, let alone bring them under the control of our intellect. For Marcus Aurelius, there's, there's a, a self-mastery. We can bring our passions to heal. We can order our passions and subordinate them, but not for Nietzsche. The problem is then, is how do we regulate our affective lives? How do we harmonize our passions without suppressing them? How do we maintain the internal tension of the body as part of a higher harmony? You notice here, I've begun to use musical vocabulary because for Nietzsche, he doesn't want to abandon the idea that we can regulate our lives. For Nietzsche, it's important that we do so. It's important for Nietzsche that we assemble ourselves, that we ourselves. It's important for Nietzsche that we make the effort to bring order to chaos. Nietzsche is not in favor of our living in a chaotic way. He's looking for order. The question then, if the intellect isn't going to order our lives, what is? Well, there's the possibility of harmonizing our passions, harmonizing them in the manner of music, to hold them together in some sense, to hold them together in an internal tension as part of a higher harmony. This is how Nietzsche is going to build up order in the self, in society, and so on. Not through the intellect, but through affect through music, through harmony. Now, formally, Nietzsche argues, passions were constrained, they were ordered, they were subordinated to a rational God, to a rational cosmos. But something has happened. This for Nietzsche is the death of God. I just read you the, the paragraph from his book called The Gay Science, where Nietzsche um, gives us this account of the madman looking for God with his lantern in the daytime, looking for God, but unable to find God. Why? Because we've killed God, because God is dead. With the death of God, there's a cultural decline of Christianity. The death of God means this decline. It actually means more than this decline. It means an active murdering of the divine. An active murdering of this idea of God. And this has a terrible price. Because what we lose with God is internal regulation, the regulation of our affective lives, of our passions. We lose what Nietzsche calls a whole system of instincts. This regulation begins to fail, and with it, there fails a sense of meaning, of purpose, of direction, which comes from having a horizon within which to live. A horizon around us. So imagine a horizon around you. Within that horizon, there is meaning, purpose, and direction. 
And that comes from affective life. It comes from a system of instincts. The problem is with the death of God, this internal regulation has begun to fail. It's going to fall apart. Human beings are becoming chaotic. We're losing our order. Well, Nietzsche is not nostalgic for Christianity, to say the least. For him, the old system denigrated life. Why? Because it measured it against an eternal rational order. And nor would Nietzsche have any, any nostalgia for the Stoic worldview. Because once again, the Stoic worldview is about rational order. But then what do we have after the death of God? Nietzsche worries about positivism, about materialism, about utilitarianism. For him, these systems of thought, which become very pervasive in the, in the 19th century, threaten to perpetuate the unhealthy aspects of Christianity. They denigrate life. And what happens is they prevent a final collapse. Because what Nietzsche wants is a collapse. What Nietzsche wants is for things to fall apart, and then maybe something can rebegin. What we find instead is an endless positivism, materialism, utilitarianism, preventing the ultimate end, the collapse, chaos. There is order, but the order is dull, is boring. The problem is that European civilization is no longer able to rank or hierarchize the passions appropriately. Our affective life suffers because we lack an inner struggle on which a genuine, new, post-Christian life depends. So we need a way of ordering the passions, a harmony between the passions. Only with this harmony, with this inner struggle of this harmony, can a new ordering of society, of the individual occur. Nietzsche, in other words, is waiting for music. He's waiting for music in some way. So, what are the dangers that, that face us right now? Firstly, passive nihilism, taking refuge in pessimism and resignation, in a rejection of any hope in the world. And I'm sure we've all felt this. I'm sure we've all gone through it, especially in the last 18 months. It seems that there is no basis for hope. It seems that we are just abandoned individually and collectively. This is passive nihilism. A nihilism which does nothing, which does not act. And we can contrast it to active nihilism. Active nihilism, by contrast, seeks to fruitlessly destroy the world. We've had enough. We want to destroy things. We want the world to end. This is the only action of which the active nihilist can dream. The action of putting end to things, putting end to oneself, putting an end to one's society, for the world to die, to say simply, death to the world. And the point here for Nietzsche is that such active nihilism is not preparing a way for anything new. It's a nihilism of total despair, of active despair, but despair nonetheless. We can think back to Christianity. In Christianity, you have the notion of apocalypse. Apocalypse will mean the end of our established order. It means the end of life as we currently know it. But the great thing about apocalypse is it reveals the truth. It reveals the way in which things actually are. The problem for Nietzsche is active nihilism is not really a proper apocalypse. The word apocalypse etymologically means unveiling or revealing, but nothing is revealed to the active nihilist. To destroy the world, is not to prepare for anything new. It could be transitional, perhaps, but the active nihilist doesn't know much about what's on the other side of the destruction. The active nihilist only wants destruction. Okay, now the worst thing of all, the last human. The last human is a state of being. It's, it's a way in which um, people can exist. The last human is characterized by banal, low intensity hedonism. So it's banal. The last human is not concerned with anything important. The last human is not thinking about the nature of suffering, 
the nature of death. The last two human is not thinking about love. He's not thinking about anything intense. Nothing that makes the last human other than flat, deadened. No intensity hedonism, seeking trivial pleasures, just trying to push the boredom back a little, finding low intensity pleasures, a self-satisfied happiness, a smug happiness. The idea of the last human is the last human has discovered what it means to be a human being, what it means to be happy. There's nothing more in the world we see around us than the everyday and ordinary banality. Passions no longer struggle. There's no internal tension. The last human is what Nietzsche predicts may become the default state of being of human beings. Well, he was writing in the 19th century. Perhaps he was thinking of the 20th century. So this is um, Nietzsche's famous um, fictional book called Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Thus spoke Dalasustra. In this book, he has his um, fictional uh, counterpart, Zarathustra. Zarathustra goes to the marketplace and he proclaims the death of God. And when no one listens to him, when everyone laughs at him, he tells them about the last humans, the last human as a form. And that's where he feels he's going to befall uh, European humanity and perhaps world humanity. That's what Zarathustra predicts will happen in the future, the appearance of the last human. That's the ultimate result of the death of God and the lack of the music, the lack of the harmony, the lack of anything enlivening. How terrible. So then, Amor Fati in Nietzsche's work. What's this all about? Let me just talk around this a little before we get to the stuff on the PowerPoint here. Amor Fati, the love of fate. The love of fate, why should we love this world? Why should we love the world that, that seems to promise only the coming of the last human? Why should we love the world that we respond to with passive or active nihilism? Why should we love this world, this world around us? Well, there's that wonderful quotation I read earlier. Let me return to it just to refresh our memories. A wonderful quotation about the world as a monster of force. Now, beyond the world that we see around us, beyond the banal and ordinary world, is the world as a monster of force, an ocean of forces storming and flooding within themselves, eternally changing, eternally rushing back. You can remember Marcus Aurelius writing about flux, writing that everything changes. For Marcus Aurelius, this is a cause for lamentation. Marcus Aurelius wants to hold on to things that are fixed, that are permanent. But Nietzsche, in this wonderful passage, seems to embrace this ocean of forces, seems to think that we have to enter into some relationship with what storms and floods, with that which is in, in flux, that which is changing, eternally rushing back. Nietzsche's term for this chaos is an odd one. It's called the will to power. And let's not go into that word in any great detail. I want simply to use by that word, um, I want to, to use by that word uh, 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 to, uh, chaos. I want to understand by that word just chaos. Chaos, will to power. Chaos, forces struggling amongst themselves. Mere power, nothing but power. What a terrible vision. But for Nietzsche, what an exciting vision too. What does it mean? It means that this is what the last man does not see. Intensity, fervor. I think, as I read these passages, of the late paintings of Van Gogh, the great Vincent Van Gogh, those late paintings, the stormy night, well, it's called the starry night, isn't it? the starry night. Intensity, fervor, passion, that's the world as we um, should be able to see it, according to Nietzsche. And that's the world he wants us to love. Amor Fati is a love for the world in all its dimensions. We should love the flux. Don't flee it. Don't look for order and fixity of the sort that Marcus Aurelius looked for. Look for a different kind of order. Look for a way to celebrate this intensity, this flux. So that's the idea. So 
Amor fati. Amor fati is a love of fate. And we can say, we can say to ourselves, I love fate. I love everything that's happened to me. But this for Nietzsche doesn't capture what's really happening when we speak, when we talk, when we affirm fate. For Nietzsche, we cannot understand Amor Fati in terms of any model of the human being as the possessor of a strong will, of volition, subjective volition. Nietzsche argues that the individual will is a fiction. The autonomous self-regulating subject is a myth. Think of Marcus Aurelius and what Marcus Aurelius would have said to this. For Marcus Aurelius, we are capable of mastery, of self-possession. But for Nietzsche, there's something more complex happening. We've said already the world is will to power. The world is chaos. But so too are we chaos, according to Nietzsche. So too are we disordered. So too are we each of ourselves a multiplicity. We are made of passions. And these passions struggle amongst themselves. They struggle against each other. So we are made of passions. These passions are in flux. They struggle. They struggle for mastery and power. And what we call the intellect, the intellect is as nothing here. What we call the intellect is only one tiny part of a larger, swirling, moving chaos. So here's the point. The objective world, the world we see around us, is but a moment of chaos, a moment of the will to power. But so too is the subjective world, our world, our interior world. Our interior life is also ultimately merely a moment of the will to power. There is chaos without and there is chaos within, both. The will to power, I'm using philosophical language here, is primary, ontologically. That means in terms of what exists. What there is, is the will to power. It's causally primary. It is in charge. If I can even use the word it, the word it is wrong. The will to power with a definite article is wrong. There's a swarming of forces. This swarming of forces is in charge. It decides, it thinks, it's free. I don't think, I don't decide, I'm not free. So for in, order for, in order for us to embrace fate, to say yes to everything, the will to power in us must embrace fate and say yes to everything. Not just our ego, not just our subject, subjective self. Something larger in us must make this affirmation. We must open ourselves to larger forces. I think back to the discussion we've just had in the last half of the first session today. I think of this notion of inspiration. That was my word. The word didn't come up um, from any of you. But I, I use that word to describe a double movement, a movement of receptivity, of openness. Something breaks in. Something comes from without. Something comes from outside. But I also use the word to just designate something active, the way in which we work with this outside, the way in which we do things with, with this receptivity. Something comes to us and we shape it. We do things with it. I want to understand this idea of creativity in terms of this openness to chaos, to the will to power. I want to understand being a creative practitioner in terms of a receptivity to chaos, to disorder, and a shaping of that disorder, a shaping of that um, chaos. I want to understand the human being as a shaper of chaos and the creative, as a creative artist, as one who's at the vanguard, who's at the forefront of this activity. What we are as creators is people who work 
with the will to power, with chaos, and who work with ourselves, who are put into a chaotic um, state. In the movement of inspiration, and this is a word Nietzsche doesn't himself place great emphasis on in his work, in the movement of inspiration, we have to control this chaos, to shape it, to do something with it, to make something with it. And that's what it means to be a creative practitioner. So the creative practitioner is very different to a philosopher in the, in the mode of Marcus Aurelius, who, who attempts to attain order and tranquility. In the Nietzschean account, the creative artist is someone who wrestles with great forces, powerful forces, forces that threaten to sweep him or her away. It is why creativity is so close to madness, why it can be perilous and frightening, why creativity needs safety of some kind, some kind of safe space, some, some, some safe company, because the forces we're coping with are enormous. So if we are creative practitioners, we have to manage ourselves such that we are in a safe enough position to admit the outside, these forces. And this is a difficult thing to be able to do. And we risk madness. Okay, so the will to power is causally and ontologically primary. It cannot be contained or channeled by any particular form. So the, the form that our, our artistic work takes cannot, be, cannot contain chaos. It trembles with chaos. It reverberates with chaos. Any form that we use is provisional and it can be blown apart at any moment. The very creativity of the will to power always involves moments of destruction, of active nihilism, moments of these. So creativity involves destruction. It involves destroying things. The point here is that there's another side to the destruction. We come out of destruction on the other side of destruction We've made something. Something has changed in the world. Chaos has been given some kind of temporary, reverberating, pulsating form. So if you listen to a strong piece of music, you can hear vibrating in it chaos. There's chaos there, something untrammeled. So that's the idea. Creation and destruction are one in this sense. The creation goes beyond destruction, beyond active nihilism. Creation makes something new in the world. So this is amor fati, the love of nature, the love of the world, the love of faith, the love of all these forces, the love of chaos. If you're a creative practitioner, you cannot do without it. You need it. You have to have it. It feeds your work. It feeds your art. Okay, it brings you, to the um, brings you close to insanity, but that doesn't matter. You need a bit of insanity. Why? Because you don't want to be a last human. You don't want to be someone who's merely um, satisfied with, with, with banal existence, with the everyday, with hedonism, with hedonism of a very bland kind. Okay. Harmonizing the passions. So Nietzsche, Nietzsche talks about something explosive, terrifying. We can't bear the explosive and the terrifying. It will shatter us unless we can find a way of ordering ourselves, of harmonizing our passions. And here we have something which for, for, for Nietzsche is characteristic of all great human beings, including artists. We seek a psychic order. We seek a way of life through the harmonizing of the passions. We seek a music, a musical harmony. We want to engage with the elemental strife of the will to power, the struggle, the strife. That's our method. We're looking for a harmony of some sort. We're looking for a music. This harmonizing can never be definitive. It can't happen once and for all. There will always need to be more creative destruction, always more overcoming. That's the idea. 
We can't rest if we are creative practitioners. We can't rest if we're artists. There will always be need for more creative destruction, our own destruction, our own death understood figuratively. We cannot survive the influx of these forces. They're too much for us to bear. We will have to be destroyed, not entirely. Something of us survives. Something of us is there to be overcome. Amor Fati is that which permits a collective, a collective power of affirmation that reshapes our system of instincts. So Amor Fati permits a collective power of affirmation on the part of the artist and the audience. I haven't spoken about the audience yet, but to create something which says yes to life, which says yes to chaos, to create something of that sort means it's experienced by an audience as well. An audience who aren't just last humans. They receive this burst of chaos, this enlivening lightning bolt. They receive it and together there's a collective. You affirm a collective power of affirmation. And this is the way in which for Nietzsche, he hoped that our system of instincts, our passions might be reordered. He dreamt of great works, great works of art, great works of, of well, politics, I suppose I call it. He dreamt of a great politics. For Nietzsche, philosophy is a product of a dying age. For Nietzsche, philosophy is, is a product of an age that has started to think rather than to feel. Philosophy is a syndrome of a wider malaise. It means you lack the passion, the ferocity that an earlier age might have had. Marcus Aurelius come very late. Socrates himself came very late. Before these figures, there was a lively, passionate life among the ancient Greeks, according to Nietzsche. And that's what we find in what Nietzsche calls tragedy, in tragic art. By the time Socrates comes along, and then hundreds of years later, Marcus Aurelius, it's gone. It's finished. Passionate life has, en has ended. And likewise, in the time in which Nietzsche himself wrote. For Nietzsche, the 19th century that he knew and he, that he grew up in is a cold cinder. And only, only a few people, a few creative artists, are able to see what's needed. Okay, now we're building up. It was wonderful reading Nietzsche. It's, it's always um, it's exciting, it's charged. So how then, how then is the artist or any human being for that matter, how then are we going to accomplish this, this amor fati? I said already that amor fati is not just about what I say. It's not just about my saying one morning, I affirm everything that is. Everything is is just great. It's got to be a feeling, something that overwhelms us, something in which we are overcome. It's got to be a feeling. We've got to be receptive and open to this feeling. We've got to let it, let it flash through us. How? How can we do it? Well, here's where the notion of the spiritual exercise comes in. But as you can imagine, the spiritual exercise has undergone an unbelievable transformation since Marcus Aurelius. 1800 years or so later, there were different kinds of spiritual exercise. And this is one which Nietzsche himself took enormously seriously. It's one which was at the center of his life as a human being. It's a, it's a idea which he doesn't really expound in any detail in any of his published works. And when you write about it in his unpublished works, it's always misleading and difficult. You never quite grasp what he's saying. Many commentators on Nietzsche's work simply throw up their hands and say, I don't understand. Or they say, there is no idea here. Nietzsche is simply deluded. Other interpreters have come up with all kinds of elaborate accounts of what this notion is and how it functions in Nietzsche's thought. Well, let's go for a simple and stupid explanation instead. 
I'm referring here to the eternal return or eternal recurrence. I want to understand this as Nietzsche's attempt at a spiritual exercise. We've seen Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, and Epictetus talk about the importance of death, talk about the cosmos. All these things are things we have to um, put before our minds if we have to test ourselves. Well, Nietzsche's idea is something similar. Nietzsche, we want to will the world exactly as it is, to desire that everything that led up to this moment return over and over again. It's a huge and difficult notion to want everything that happened over and over again. Let's, let's start by thinking about our lives. What would it mean to want everything that happened to us to happen again? This thought should terrify us. And this has already come up in discussion. Everything that happened to us happening again, over and over again. Can we bear this thought? Wouldn't it tear us apart? Think of terrible incidents from our past happening again and again. This is what Nietzsche asks of us. What he asks us to do is to affirm the energies that comprise ourselves, individuals, and the world, to affirm them as, move, as, as um, movements of becoming. Becoming is a philosophical term meaning flux, transience, not being, but becoming. To affirm them as they might be productive of new ways of living. To affirm chaos. To affirm the chaos of which we are made. It is only possible, Nietzsche says, by a special kind of human being. You might have heard the expression Ubermensch. We used to translate this as Superman, the overhuman, the Ubermensch, a kind of human life which wants nothing more than to overcome its present form, rejecting any accommodation with prevailing notions of happiness. Let's contrast here the last human with the overhuman, the greatest possible contrast we could imagine. The overhuman wants to overcome itself, wants to overcome its form, does not care about its own survival, wants to die figuratively, wants an end to itself over and over and over again. What an extraordinary thing to want to become or to try to become. For Nietzsche, the threshold of becoming the overhuman is being able to will the eternal return, to be able to desire the world exactly as it is, as it was, to affirm it, to affirm the world as exactly as it is, as it led up to this moment, over and over again. Well, again, the overhuman. The art of transfiguration, seeking to redeem life through creative action. It does not think of itself as an endpoint, as a finally evolutionary stage. Continual desire for overcoming, metamorphosis physiologically, culturally, spiritually. No interest in self-preservation and what's called health, including mental health, or even happiness aligned with the will to power. Sometimes, sometimes Nietzsche says that it will take generations of training, of breeding for the overhuman to appear. Sometimes he suggests you can become overhuman at one stroke through a titanic act of affirmation. The text, you know, Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's text is, um, you know, gives us different accounts of this. Let me stop staring my, um, oh, here we are, yes. So in common between Nietzsche and, and the Stoics, the idea of philosophy as being more than just abstract and theoretical. In common with the Stoics, philosophy is about the art of living. It engages the whole of existence. For the Stoics, a kind of conversion is necessary. We uncover the original self, the authentic self, what we were, 
we uncover the origin and we open up ourselves to a new future. For Nietzsche, likewise, this conversion is continuous, it's ongoing, it's a transformation. For the Stoics, human reason is more important than the passions. Nietzsche is the passions. The Stoics aim at the mastery of the passions. Nietzsche aims at the harmonizing of the passions. For the Stoics, the cosmos is world order. For Nietzsche, the cosmos, the chaosmos, is the will to power, it's chaos. For the Stoics, we have to try and find a horizon of inherent meaning, purpose, and direction. For Nietzsche, there's a lack of inherent meaning and purpose and direction. We can't find meaning, purpose, and direction. We have to create it for ourselves. That's the role of the creative practitioner, of the artist. The artist creates some great work that lays out a horizon in which we can live as human beings, that lays out a, a place where meaning is possible. We live in a space opened up by the great work. The Stoics, the great danger is one of alienation. We lose ourselves, we lose a sense of who it is we are. For Nietzsche, the danger is one of nihilism, of the last human. For the Stoics, there's the model of the sage, like Marcus Aurelius, or Epictetus, or, or Seneca. We learn from the example of the stage, of the sage. For Nietzsche, the overhuman is the model. This is the way in which Nietzsche um, can be contrasted to the Stoics. Okay. So let's think now about creativity. We've talked about form and how form trembles, how form pollinates as it receives the will to power. Nietzsche is an auto philosopher. One of his most famous works is called Eki Homo. Behold the man, behold the man, behold he himself, Nietzsche. He wrote this book on the brink of losing his sanity. So when Nietzsche's writing about sanity here, he's not fooling around. The man himself lost his sanity. He lost his sanity. And the last work, last finished work he wrote um, was his autobiography, a work of auto philosophy. The question then is, how can you write of these experiences of chaos? Words are always falsifications of becoming of flux. Nietzsche himself wrote prose. Well, the prose is musical. And this is the idea. He makes continual use of various kinds of musical device, symmetry, crescendo, inflection, tone, tempo, to express and affect the body. Marcus Aurelius wrote in a very controlled way, in wonderful, with wonderful style. Marcus Aurelius wrote things that he himself would want to return to, to contemplate. Nietzsche writes in a different way. Nietzsche is not focused primarily on reason. He wants his writing to dance, to sing. He wants a musical prose. Only an appropriately musical prose can evoke and communicate a clash of drives and impulses that's at work in our affective lives. He wants a musical prose then in that case, in which things clash and resolve. And this is, what Nietzsche, this is how Nietzsche writes his own philosophical autobiography. He actually uses a, a, a musical form, a sonata form, uh, in, in which he recounts his own formation an overall pattern of exposition, development, and recapitulation, moving from dissonance and contradiction to consonance and harmony. The actual structure of that work, which was only noticed about 100 years after he wrote it, the structure is exactly that of a sonata in classical music. And Nietzsche sets out an exposition, the themes he's going to explore, he develops them, and he recapitulates them. The movement here is from dissonance, and contradiction to consonance and harmony. The, the book holds together chaos, not by subordinating it to reason, 
but by finding a tension in which various passions can coexist and can be held together. And that's the way in which his psychic order is developed such that he can become the philosopher of eternal recurrence. That's a story he tells. He's telling the story of how he became that philosopher who could bear the most terrible thought of all, the thought of eternal recurrence. Isn't that something? So that's how he works. He works musically. And this is something that those of you working in, in, in um, media other than written media, um, those of you working in film or in music, this is where you can, you can take his ideas and do things with them. Okay, so Nietzsche's heady stuff. Oops, oh, what have I done here? Oh, yes, um, here we are. I want them to set an exercise similar to um, the exercise in the first session. So I want you to spend some time at this, and I want after to bring together your reflection and to reflect on them in turn. And this is a thought that really, you know, I haven't been able to leave behind. It's really, really gripped me um, in the last few years. And I want to, I put this up here as a, as a kind of provocation, um, something which is maybe troubling in some way. But yet at the same time, I just can't, um, I can't leave it behind. I can't, I can't move from it. I just seem to be fixated on this thought. This is the thought. This is written in the spirit of Nietzschean philosophy. To write a work about your past is to reaffirm everything that led up to that writing. Because the work wouldn't have existed without the particularities of your experiences, your personal history, your past. The condition of that work's existence is exactly the life that you led that led up to you writing it. As such, it cannot help but be an affirmation of that life. However that life was experienced at that time, it depends on that life for its existence. Creating an artwork based on your experiences, even if, even if quite distantly so, is in some sense an affirmation of those experiences. It's not simply that you survive to tell the tale, but the condition of telling that tale and creating an artwork for those same experiences. Well, this is my attempt to write in my own clumsy way, something similar to what we might find in Nietzsche. And relate, and relate it to um, creating works of art. Let me contextualize this paragraph a little. In the first part of today's session, I mentioned the work of Samuel Beckett. And of course, Samuel Beckett's work is very funny and all kinds of things. But often Samuel Beckett's work is understood to be very bleak and very pessimistic. And what I said was, there's always something optimistic about Beckett's endeavor to write writing, creating, creating anything of any kind, there's an underlying optimism and affirmation that's part of that. So that works of art, even if, they, even if they're very, very gloomy, nevertheless are animated by an optimism of reading, uh, of reaching a, an, an audience. I'm thinking here now of Tanya's um, point she made earlier, uh, when Tanya was writing in the um, persona of this 12 year old girl, exhorting herself to keep writing, to keep creating, to keep doing things. And the idea that words keep away death in some sense. Um, the idea of staying in life by means of words. Which is the idea of an optimism of art, where art links you to these great germinative um, forces, uh, the great forces of chaos. Engage them, keep writing. But when we're doing this, we have to create our work out of something. And perhaps one of the things we're creating our work out of is our personal lives, our histories, our experiences, whatever those experiences are like. And perhaps behind our work, there's an autobiography that we're writing, even if we're making film, even if we're, maybe even if we're dancing, I'm not sure. It's difficult when it comes to dance or music here. But the idea is you're, you are drawing on the particularities of your experience, what you and only you have undergone. And that your own life has become your material. And by becoming your material, 
by offering itself to your artistic practice, to your creative practice. There's something affirmative in that act of creation. The act of creation itself is affirmatory. And this is something which I find um, chilling and frightening as a thought. It's what I find chilling and frightening about all of Nietzsche's thought. I wrote a novel based on Nietzsche's ideas, uh, I, the novel based on Nietzsche's life. You know what, I'll tell you a secret. I did so because I, I hated Nietzsche. I have a hatred of Nietzsche. You know, I, I, he, he's as far from me as you could possibly find. The philosophers to whom I'm naturally drawn are extraordinarily different to Nietzsche. The philosophers who I um, revere are very, very far away from Nietzsche. I always find Nietzsche demonic and frightening. And writing this paragraph is my attempt to confront in Nietzsche's work what I find terrifying, the terror and the horror of the affirmation that Nietzsche asks for from us. Well, what's wonderful about Nietzsche's work is that he also feels this terror. He also feels this horror. Nietzsche himself dramatizes this terror in his character Zarathustra, in that work of fiction that he calls Thus Spoke Zarathustra. In that text, again and again, the character Zarathustra is unable to make this grand affirmation. He can't do it. He can't get there. He collapses. He can't face the idea the terrible moments of his life have to be transfigured and affirmed. He cannot cope. That's the drama of the first three parts of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Again and again, Zarathustra cannot do it. Perhaps he's able to do so at the end of part three of Zarathustra. Perhaps. There are differences of interpretation. So my hatred of Nietzsche is something Nietzsche has for this idea himself. He hates it, he fears it. His own character, Zarathustra, cannot undergo this experience. So what I want you to do is to think about this idea. Think about your work. Think about your work in this Nietzschean frame, framework. Do you agree with that paragraph up there on Zoom? Why might you agree with it? Why not? Does it frighten you? Does it terrify you? Why or why not? Well, this is um, my attempt to bring us all as close as we can bear to this terrible, fiery sun, this chaos. And my question to you is, can you bear the ordering of this chaos that creative practice is? So once again, we'll have about 25 minutes for this exercise. Two, three points that I want to add. Yeah. Thank you. yeah, thank you very much. So the idea of a work being written for the future. So all works are written for the future in some sense. Nietzsche in his lifetime and self-published, you know, people wouldn't publish his works, generally speaking. And he often wrote about writing for the future for the friends who'd be able to read him finally when his work became, you know, more widely distributed. This idea of the future, um, and I, it was very interesting, this, uh, this idea of, um, this is, this is a different temporality. Um, the writing becomes, I don't know, a promise, an opening to the future, um, to unknown readers. And it's, so it's not simply our past or the past. Maybe this is, this is the idea of that life again, the Victorian idea of, of that life. We reaffirm a few things, not everything. Some things that hold you captive, things that stick around, things that, that, things that remain, you're not quite sure what or why they remain. They're rather like the ghosts in the others, which came up um, in uh, Katerina's, Katerina's um, thoughts. Um, they, they remain, you're not sure why, whether they're good or bad. These are the monsters that drive us. Another point about the lives of others, the way in which our um, biographies mingle with other people, uh, with the things we've read, the things we've heard, uh, with anecdotes we appropriate from other people. I know I do that. I knit people's um, anecdotes and put them in the novels. Um, so there's, there's this question of this network of which we are a part. Yeah, that's what I want to explore, actually. If I were to do you know, a few days on this sort of topic, would be 
a communal form of um, of amor fati, some communal work, you know, this is not, not a solitary thing at all. In Nietzsche and the Birds, the novel, it's about a band, it's about a bunch of musicians. So it's a communal work, it's not just about one individual, it's about a bunch of people getting together and creating this, um, this idea of a micro utopia. So the idea is here, here is a, here is a, a place for, of hope, a micro utopia, where you have a model for future life. And uh, I, know, I know a few musicians, I'm always interested in people who are um, free improvisers, so who do free improvisational music, where you get together and you're not quite sure what it is you're going to play or what instruments you're going to use or what sounds are going to uh, be, be incorporated into the performance. And sometimes the sounds can be the sounds in the room or someone brings along a dog, all kinds of things. Anything can happen in, 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 in um, free improvisation of this kind as practiced by Derek Bailey and, and other people. Um, you know, it, it still, still happens here in, here in Newcastle. And this, people often say, they often think of this as a... Um, as a micro utopia, as a way of understanding how people can work as an, as an ensemble. Think of, um, I think now John Coltrane, the great saxophonist and his quartet that he formed in the early 1960s. And that quartet, you find each person is an improvising individual. Each is able to produce something uh, which feels new and fresh, but that also draws on, the, on their specific origins on who it is they are as, um, as black men in the United States, as African-Americans, um, their particular histories and their histories um, um, historically and otherwise. And yet so they, they, they improvise individually and collectively. There's improvisational work at both levels, individually and collectively. And what they're improvising with is certainly their individual histories, but a group history as well. And the history of jazz as well, you know. Um, anyway, these 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 wild thoughts that that um, that fall out of my head at these at these moments. But here again is a micro utopia, where each can improvise and be creative in response to others. That it's it's a group, it's a band of people, not individuals. Anyway, I'm not sure how useful those reflections are. But thank you everyone for um, your contribution today. It's something these these are topics which. Um, really uh, disturb and interest me, which is probably a good reason to teach them. You know, something which really, which I find risky in some way. You know, these, these are risky ideas, disturbing ideas. And thank you, those of you who've shared um, these very candid moments about your life and about your experience. This is difficult to do. So thank you all, great fun. Uh, we're coming to the end of the session and I'll make sure to send through um, the slides via, um, through Nemanja, and Emmanuel will pass those on to you. But thanks very much, all of you.